Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This morning, Firefly released the video of Blue Ghost landing on the moon, and it is truly an inspirational and awesome experience, and you should actually check it out on their channel with the great soundtrack and music. But for me, it showed a whole bunch of cool stuff, and it specifically showed this shot of it landing on the moon, backlit by the, you know, showing the shadow. You can see the chunk of regolith flying off there and landing on the far side of the crater. This is really cool. And we now have enough information to know exactly where it landed down to within a few meters. So I just want to talk about this video and all the cool stuff that I saw and explain how we figured out where it landed. First of all, yeah, it talks about this passive radiator thermal control. That is a that piece of foil there that's flapping up and down. That's a cover for the thermal radiators. You'll notice that during this landing, everything's sort of vibrating. But moreover, it's vibrating like at a constant rate, as if there's a constant drumbeat going on, right? You can see this happening. And this is really because the thrusters that they are using, they don't throttle. They just turn the thrusters on and off, right? It's called, it's basically pulse width modulation, on, off, on, off to generate the net amount of throttle or thrust that they actually need. You'll see this throughout the landing. Then we get this downward view, and it was the first moment where I saw some craters I actually recognized. We knew where they were targeting, we didn't know where they ended up, but when I saw this, I recognized that was the intended landing site. And so you can see how these craters all match up. So this is the full frame of that image, and this is what it looks like on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter mapping system when I do a sort of approximate 3D projection. This is what it looks like from overhead, and you'll notice the lighting is completely different. It's coming from the opposite side, and it's also coming from much lower angle than any of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter images. And I can sort of fake the illumination change by just inverting the color screen, but there's a whole bunch of craters that simply won't show up on this map because the illumination was at too steep an angle. And so keep that in mind, a lot of craters that are visible here may not be visible on the map when we look uh, in comparison. Yeah, this camera is obviously looking out towards the sun, which is you know, low on the horizon, and this camera is on the other side looking out towards the Earth. And this is a great image to show how uh, craters may not be visible in the map. If we bring up the corresponding Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter image, you can see that all the small craters match up on the left, but there's this huge black area that is totally not illuminated, which is not evident. And that is because the sun is so low on the horizon, five degrees above the horizon. Why did they land when the sun was so low on the horizon? I tell you why, because they landed at sunrise. You want to land and get the maximum amount of daylight before the sun sets and the mission is basically ended. So you land just after sunrise. Anyway, the next thing to watch for is the hazard avoidance maneuver. You see it actually pitched over and changed its landing position. It looked down at that spot below it and it said, nope, I'm going to go and move and find a new place which has fewer hazards. But of course, figuring out where it actually ended up meant that we had to track the craters in the cameras and map them to places on the surface. And one of the things that got in the way was uh, the artistic editing, switching between all the different cameras actually made it hard, harder for us, um, you know, lunar sleuths because we would watch a sequence track the craters and then it would switch away and we'd come back and it wouldn't immediately be obvious which crater was which. So what we actually did was we took their raw footage and we re-edited it so that specific sequences would play in sequence and then uh, you know they would just jump, but it became much easier to track one crater from, from one sequence to the next. And so it made it much easier for us to look at this big like dark ridge structure there and see how it continues from one frame to the next, we then recognize what those two craters in the middle were, and then when we transition down, we could then connect these two craters in. And this view was the most important because you could see the Earth and you had an exact bearing. Anyway, obviously this is the highlight. And again, look at the clouds. Look at how those clouds are pulsing. Remember I told you the rocket thrusters were turning on and off very quickly? So we saw that same effect in the dust getting kicked up. The other thing to see is the dust cloud disappears almost immediately. On Earth, clouds take a long time to settle because the tiny particles that make them up experience a lot of aerodynamic drag, and so the particles fall very slowly. But on the Moon, without the air to slow them down, the tiny particles fall at exactly the same rate as the macroscopic chunks of rock. 
Now they flip the camera around and shows what the sunrise looks like. And it looks initially like a, you know, just a static image, but we can tell that they took this shot almost immediately after landing. How do we know that? Because it's not actually a static image, it's a very short video sequence. And if you ping pong it back and forth, you can actually see the dust is still settling in this image. You see it, the dust cloud heading off into the distance. Because you know this dust is getting kicked out at hundreds, maybe thousands of miles an hour. It's getting entrained in this rocket exhaust. And rocket exhausts, of course, move very quickly, kilometers per second. And now, of course, we have to do the inevitable, let's watch this in slow motion routine. So look, it's coming down. Again, you see the tiny little spacecraft shadow in the distance. And if you look very carefully, you can actually see the rocket exhaust coming out. You see how it forms like a triangle? That's just perspective that's doing that. So the rocket exhausts are basically blocking sunlight. Now what happens next is these rocket exhausts around the edge, they hit the surface and then they squeeze in at the middle. So you get this like jet of material getting pushed upwards, right? You've got, it's like squeezing an apple pit between your fingers. The exhausts come together, they squeeze the material and it shoots upwards really quickly into the bottom of the spacecraft. Now in the middle of these cool crepuscular rays, watch the horizon. This is the spacecraft now touching down and it settles unevenly. Remember we only had three of the contact switches trigger? Well, I think that's what's going on here is you have the, the one on the right nearest the sun hits first and then the two on the left. And then finally, the whole thing slowly settles back down towards the crater. And if you look very carefully, you can see small rocks, pieces of regolith, rolling around inside that crater. Basically, they've been kicked up with some amount of energy and they are slowly settling at their own rate. Now, we did see that one little uh, chunk of rock get kicked out. And I did actually do the math on this and I figured out that it had to have been thrown out at around five and a half meters per second or 20 kilometers per hour. So anyway, coming back to the final location, again, I just took a look at the various images and I did my best to map those images to crater patterns which were in the vicinity. And this was you know, just a whole lot of trial and error and guesswork using that human brain. Uh, what eventually made it work was figuring out the camera that was pointed towards the Earth. And knowing the bearing to the Earth and the field of view of the camera, I figured out bearings for a bunch of craters, drew lines from those craters and figured out roughly where they converged. And it happened to be on the edge of a little crater, which pretty much matches what we see. But again, the map doesn't really match the illumination conditions particularly well. What does match the illumination conditions is this image showing what the camera, what the spacecraft saw as it was coming down. And yes, sure enough, it actually saw the landing site during this descent. And for comparison, this is where it was originally intending to land. And so my coordinates put it at 18.56347 north by 61.80985 east, very approximately. And we actually got confirmation of that. This is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It took an image. Now it wasn't passing over the site. It did an oblique low angle image, but sure enough in the middle of that square, there's the tiny white pixel, which is apparently also casting a shadow. It's in the right place. That is where the spacecraft is. And so again, putting this in the whole context, it's off there on the right of the moon, inside this Maria, Mari Chrysium. And if we zoom in, well, uh, it's slightly to the northeast, I guess, of the original landing site on the edge of a tiny little crater. And there it's getting to work. We've got this great photo of the lunar vacuum cleaner working right now. We've heard that the GPS, uh, the Luger experiment, is successfully operated from the lunar surface. It has been a great mission so far. And of course, I'm looking forward to doing this whole exercise again in a few days when Intuitive Machines IM2 Athena touches down near the South Pole. And once again, we'll all have a race to see who is the fastest uh, lunar you know, surveyor, whatever. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.